and welcome to Inside Netball. Courtney Tidy, Jenny Woods, Dean Wilson. Wow, we've just finished the final round robin matches of the ANZ Premiership. It was exciting. The tactics, they had everything to play for against the Mystics at home in Christchurch, but they couldn't quite get it done. And they will head to Invercargill for the elimination final against the Steel. Jenny, your thoughts on this one? Well, the thoughts that I had really were the, f the difference between the earlier games in round 15, the ones that really had something on them, and then the, the last game of round 15 between the Stars and the Magic when there was really nothing on it. I think credit to the Stars, they... They were trying to put something out there. I thought I was really disappointed in the magic. I felt some of those players really, they gave me the impression they couldn't be bothered. And um, I thought that was disappointing. But, you know, apart from that, great round. And as you said, I think, credit to the Stars. They came out biggest winning margin, I think, of the Premiership this year. They came out firing. You know, they were disappointed. They did not want to finish the season the way they did. They obviously wanted to win, but they didn't want to finish on that game. They were, as we've talked about, number one spot for nine rounds. So they came out and showed a little bit of, or glimpses of exactly what they showed in those first few rounds. But you've got to credit the steel um, they did everything they could against a fast finishing pulse they've nailed the elimination final and to me that's given them a huge huge advantage of making that grand final well and they call uh, ILT Stadium the fortress and uh, we know what it's like Dean when you're down there playing uh, for with the crowd on your side and with the crowd against you but I mean what does it mean for the tactics to have to go down there now and face the steel at home because we know how strong they are well I, the, the one thing comment I'd like to make is with that crowd I, I thought there were two interesting um, comparisons between the Christchurch crowd when we saw the mystics and the tactics play each other and the night before when the steel had played the pulse and I just thought the Christchurch crowd showed what a home crowd can be they you know they were positive, they were loud, they cheered, they carried on. The Invercargill crowd did all of that, but they booed. Mm. And I, I just, I do not understand the booing. Um, I think it's really unattractive. I think it reflects really badly on the crowd. And I really hope they don't do it um, in this elimination final. But whether you like the booing or not, does it give them an advantage? And I actually have done a little bit of research, quite like looking at research <laughs> on what home advantage is. And there were some key points that do give you home advantage. Crowd density, a massive one. So filling a stadium, we know the Steel are gonna do that. We know they're halfway, we're probably over halfway there already and we're only midweek. Um, also, you know, there's some suggestion, and officials will say this doesn't happen, but there's subconscious bias in favour of the officials when they are there. They can't help but subconsciously be biased. And, you know, teams perform better as well, statistically, when you've got an enthusiastic crowd. Is booing enthusiastic? They're getting behind. They're showing their disappointment. Are they subconsciously affecting the officials? So, yes, it might not be something that we morally like the sound of booing but is this one of the key points that does help the steel when they play in the fortress that is in Chicago? I'm not sure if I agree with the booing I don't like the booing but I know as a player when I used to go down there and play against the steel and you're standing in the tunnel and you can hear the crowd and you run out you like hit with like a wall of noise my debut back in the day Cathcock said to me get up the front and run out at the front because you will be hit with this noise and as a player you need to use it well, I would just pretend they're on my side and use it you know to sort of build you up so I think they can still do it we want to make our region proud book your tickets now it's going to be a goodie we need a um they call it a fortress down there so we need to make it red and black you know, the other things that it came out in the research as well, um, negating the fatigue associated with long travel. And we know for the mm. steel, you know, they've got the longest to move of all of the franchises. You know, we know ourselves when we fly up and down the country to get from Auckland down to Invercargill, as much as we love the Deep South, it is a massive day. And it's the one day for our commentary team, we actually have to go a whole day earlier because of the travel factor. That's taken out of it again for the steel. They will have to do it potentially the following week if they were to make that final. Your thoughts on the tactics, the way they played, because they did make quite a lot of errors. And then if they are playing in Invercargill, you can imagine Imagine when they get that pressure on it's taking them quite a few passes to get in the circle the drum will start beating the pressure comes on them 
They've got the players. And if you look at the players in that tactics team, they have got superstars down there. Cardin Berger, Jane Watson, Tapai Selby Rickett, if she comes to the fore on in her game, Ellie Bird. Um, they've got the players. For me, which I think um, showed up in that Mystics game, was can they step up though when that yeah. pressure goes on and that's what really put the big question mark for me in that tactics mystics game they didn't convince me that they can and you know i you know i admire the players i n admire what they can do out there but that's my big question mark. I agree, and I think it was interesting how you prefaced that little bit about um, Tapia Selby Rickett, if she can or if she does. I'm, I'm not convinced by t uh, Selby Rickett this season. Um, you know, and of course, she, well, she's not going to be phased by the stadium. I mean, she played there for yes. any number of any number of seasons, but um, I'm just not sure. But I, I think this season, the um, the Steel have proven themselves. You know, they're they're a. Gr they're, I said it last week. They are a great story, and they are just riding this wave of, um, I suppose, almost unexpected success. And they also seem to be an incredibly tight team and interesting talking to some of the players after the game uh, last round they a number of them sort of said oh you know we're a weird bunch or we're a strange <laughs> bunch and I asked um, I think it was Shannon Saunders I said, what, do you, what do you mean by you're all strange she said we're all just very much individuals and but we get on and I'm thinking well that's you know that's life isn't it and if you um, you know any good workplace or whatever if you have a mix of people who are different but get on you're on the way. And I've peaked at the right time. I'm looking here at the ladder positioning after each round. It wasn't until round 15 that they hit second spot. You know, at different points, they were fourth, they were fifth in round six. You know, they have timed their run beautifully. And I think they've been coming up with great game plans. Shannon Saunders, the captain, she said, oh, we play quite vanilla netball, but it's possession netball. Possession wins the games. And when they have played the Mystics recently and they've beaten them, it's just they're controlling the ball, they're controlling uh, the team. Now, the Mystics, they will get the week off, but they will be in the grand final uh, at Spark Arena on August 8th. Now, something interesting that Silver Ferns assistant coach Debbie Fuller uh, said in commentary at the Stars Magic game was that she was disappointed with the Magic's fitness standards. Uh, and she said it was quite telling in the way that they did the season and also finished off the season. But then she said the only team that sort of adhered to the Silver Ferns fitness standards and put them in place was the Mystics and they're the ones that are straight into the grand final. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. And she said the only ones who, who as you say, put them in and adhered to them. And I think, you know, a few murmurings throughout the season, people have been thinking, oh, you know, was that really a good thing to do? Do you need to be that fit? Well, let's just wait and see after the next couple of weeks. But look where they are. They're at the top of the table. We get to Spark Arena. There's the elimination final, the tactics versus steel. And now we're going to hear from someone who's played for both of these teams, and that is Jodie Brown. Jodie Brown, you have been fortunate enough to play for the tactics, the steel, and uh, we'll say the mystics, but it was actually the diamonds because it was a few years ago. Um, so you've covered all three teams that are in the final. Let's talk the elimination final. I want you to give it to me straight. Who's going to win it and why? Oh, look, I think I think it's going to be a great game. I, um, I, I tend to favour the steel a little bit. I think being at home in front of their home crowd, I think they just kind of play with nothing to lose. They Nothing really phases them. They're really focused on themselves. Um, and that's what they've been right, right throughout the season. Uh, and I think teams have just found it really hard to break that. And especially now they've got their momentum going into that semi, uh, elimination final. So, yeah, I'm, pretty, I'm back in the steel. Oh, interesting. Well, you were at the game um, Tactics Mystics. You know, obviously the Tactics, they didn't come away with the win. The Mystics got that. But what impressed you about the Tactics that they are going to need to do if they were to win against the Steel this coming weekend? Yeah, look, I like the way they started. In particular, it's Pia Selby Rickett. She started with a hiss and a roar, and I thought, yeah, this is going to be the game where she just keeps going and going. Um, fortunately, she faded away a bit. So I'd like to see her keep that consistency throughout the game. I think that would be huge for the tactics down that end. Um, I really love the injection of Erikana Peterson. She made a huge difference when she came on. Um, just her calmness, her leadership down there attacking in. Um, and also, she just looks directly to the circle, which is what sometimes I think they lack. 
Um, defensively, I, I think you look, they're always going to get ball with Berger and Watson down there. But I think the the, the mid court in terms of Ali and Poy, who do the workout in front of them, is crucial as well. So they didn't probably get as much ball as what we're used to in that game um, on the weekend. So I think they'll probably be racking up for a big one to try and get as much ball as they can down down in Invercargill. Talking of Invercargill, you know, everyone talks about the crowd as the eighth player um, and that they have such a huge influence. You know, you've played with the crowd behind you. You've played with the crowd against you. You know, what is it like walking into that cauldron? Oh, it's an it's amazing feeling. It's like you lift about five inches when you walk into that stadium, even when you're walking in just to get ready for the game. Um, it's great. And, and it was funny because I was saying to the Sky crew after the game on um, uh, Sunday, what, like, they would be starting their prep now, like all of Invercargo. I bet you there'll be flags up in the main street. You know, there'll be everything going on. And I guess that just lifts you as a player to know that you've got that support and so many people are interested. Um, they talk about having one-eyed Can- Cantabrians, but I'm pretty sure they're one-eyed down in Invercargo as well. So, you know, like it's it, it's just such an awesome feeling as a player to know you've got, you know, 3,000 people behind you as well. Uh, and also, I guess it's that bit of that mental game as well and what you play with the opposition. The Mystics, they're straight through to that grand final. It has been a long time since an Auckland netball team has won a premiership, have won anything, basically. It's something like 18 years, I think, if we look way back to, you know, the good old days of the Diamonds. What is, you know, are you backing them to win this whole thing or what's it going to take for the Mystics to win their first in a very, very long time? If the Mystics can play uh, what they're capable of playing, I truly believe that they probably could win that final by double digits, I think. When they are are capable of what they do on attack and then defensively, I think they are very wise and they place themselves in um, some good places to take ball, I think they could win that final by uh, double digits. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to see them do that consistently for a game or even over the season. They've had those patches. So I think maybe when the pressure comes on, it might be a tighter game in terms of you know whoever's going to be there, the steal or the tactics. Uh, but look, uh, breaking down that connection from Toyava to uh, Nuweke is going to be the key. And I think that's probably what everyone's been trying to do all season. The Steel have been the only team that have been able to do that so far. Uh, but like defensively you can never rule out I mean uh, the work uh, that Sully Fitzpatrick does down there and the way that she leads her team has been exceptional this season I've been really impressed with the way that she um, has conducted herself and how she kind of just keeps her team focused on the next task and I think that's probably something that has been lacking from um, Auckland teams you know in the past Great to hear from Jody Brown there. Now, Adine, before we spoke to Jody, you touched on the situation in Australia with the Suncorp Super Netball and the COVID situation, which may affect what we had penciled in with the English Roses coming to New Zealand to play the Silver Ferns in September. If that doesn't go ahead, what do we do? Because Debbie Fuller, she said the Silver Ferns, they need international exposure. They need tough games, especially heading into pinnacle years coming up. Well, we got our thinking caps on after this. We're like trying to think laterally. And something that happened uh, in 2009 and in 2000 was a World 7. And we're thinking, look, you've got a whole lot of inputs. 28, I think, in the Sun Court League. We've yes. got a few here. George Fisher. Um, we've got Caitlin Bassett. And who's my third one? Amog Boise is here as well. And so if the English can't get here, um, then do you look at some of these imports? And, and when we say the English can't get here, obviously things change a little bit for them because the Aussie league has been pushed out a little bit so it's it's limited the time for England to potentially get here. So do you throw together a World 7? Like how awesome if you could convince some of those imports from Australia to come over there. Yes they will have to do two weeks in quarantine but you know also an opportunity for some of these ANZ teams to go "Mm -hmm, come over see what it's like in New Zealand. We'd quite like to contract you as well. So you know when they did play in 2009 it was um, 2-1 um, Australia took it out against the Ferns in 2000, the Ferns took it out 2-1 and so we know if you can get a World 7 here in New Zealand it's a brilliant brilliant opportunity throwing a New Zealand men into the mix as well to make it a you know um, a round robin like the Cadbury series, under 21s haven't had the opportunity to play so it could be a pretty cool series in September if you could pull it off. So you're suggesting a quad series so just get this in my older here. <laughs> so you've got the men under 21s? Yeah, I think throw in the under 21s. Under 21s, World, World New Zealand. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, which mm. which is then replicating a little bit like um, a Commonwealth Games, and that's what they wanted out of that series, the Cadbury series, when they played the men last time. So you had, you know, back to back really tough games, then you go into a semi, then you go into a final. And I just think it would make for such spectacular net. Well, imagine even watching the New Zealand men play the World Seven. Yes. I mean, that would be awesome too. And if we look at who is available, it could be Shamira Sterling. Samantha Wallace, Carla Pretoria, Lenise Potgita could yeah. come back, uh, Janelle Fowler could come back. So you look at these names and you think, oh my goodness, who's going to coach them? I say Norma <laughs> Plummer, possibly, <laughs> we bring Norma over. Maybe with a Von Willerine, uh, Yvette McClaws and Jury could be available. Oh, she would be doing the 21s. Uh, but I think there's so much that we could do in September if we can't get the roses Yeah, it's a, that's a great idea. And actually, aren't thinking of the under-21s, I mean, are they still training, meeting, given that their event was cancelled? I'm yes. sure. I think the event's obviously still keeping in contact mm. with them, close contact. But you've got to feel for them. They missed out. They, they did miss really out. And that would give anything. them something. It would give them something. And, and I know you didn't like this idea of mine too, <laughs> but I, I thought, you know, looking at the Ollie Whites that we've seen at the Olympics, and they've got this under-23, is it, team? And yes, under-23, and then you've got, what, four? Four others. Yes. Others, four or three That's others. That's a bit wishy-washy. But it was, see, I thought that could be a way of strengthening the under-21s when they come up against the Silver Ferns or the New Zealand men. You're Throw in a couple of players that may have just missed out on the ferns to play with the under-21 team to to just um, give them a bit of extra experience. Then do you also just ask Anna Harrison to come and play for the World Seven teams because Ooh. she said she's not available for the ferns. She's <gasps> talk so about interesting comments. La, uh, sorry, yes. but after that game between the stars and the magic, I, and I wasn't quite sure if I was hearing correctly. Yes. So she was thinking about perhaps going back to volleyball. Yeah, she did say that. Oh. Oh, look, there's lots going on in my mind at the moment. Um, I'm really, like I said, pleased with where my body's at, and so I'll be competing at some in something next year. And I'd really like to give beach volleyball a go. So I'm trying to weigh up what my options are. Um, I love this team, and it was quite emotional at the end. Um, I'd hate to think it was the last time, but. I don't know yet, it's, it's time will tell. It's awesome to hear that she has been pleasantly surprised with how her body has got through this season. I mean, how many gains did she get yesterday? All, all she that got eight, eight tips on her own. And then the gains, you know, add on top, I think two or three yeah, rebounds, it was four gains pick as well. ups. It was just insane what she was doing out there. So, yes, yeah, see, another contender for our starting, starting or our World 7. Just need a sponsor. Any sponsors out there? Cadbury, Imagine maybe. Cool. Cadbury, someone else, jump on board yes. to support that, that World 7. Uh, now, Jenny, you don't <laughs> quite like the idea of the under-21s with some older heads, but what about an ANZ Premiership All-Stars team? players that didn't quite make the ferns because we've had NZAs at the Cadbury series. Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility for them to still get some netball under their belt? And if there is injuries in the ferns, they're still training and they're still putting their hand up to say, I'm available if need be. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because also too, being serious about everything, the, um, you know, when the selectors name their squad, the Silver Fern squad on August the 10th, I mean, it's going to be a bigger squad, isn't it? So there's going to be quite a few, well, not quite a few. There will be some players who will miss out on that final, will it be a 12? 12. Presumably, that she'll pick. So there'll be a few players there and um, I think also too there's going to be some very good players who will miss selection mm. because you look in that midcourt particularly, there's a lot of names that pop up and you think, well, gee, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I quite like that idea. I'm not, I must not come across as a negative person. <laughs> no, you're just <laughs> giving your opinion. Yeah, yeah. So just thinking, we're trying to squeeze this into September just because that was when it was penciled in, but actually, do you even limit yourself to that? Because do you actually push it to after the Constellation Cup, which is in October, therefore taking out the MIQ piece if the input's coming from Australia? So do you have to keep just thinking that little bit wider? How do you get these competitions across? Mm. How do you make sure that they still happen? They have the international experience, the Silver Ferns leading into the Commonwealth Games and things while working around the limitations that is the pandemic current world. We're getting into finals of the ANZ Premiership, but it's also getting into contracting time, right? Where play, we're going to see player movements. We've already seen coach movements. We don't know who's going to be filling some coaching positions, but we're seeing coaches being moved out. Who out there 
would you, if you had a team, would you sign? That's potentially sitting on a bench somewhere. For me, I'm going to say Savia Tui. Mm -hmm. We know what she can do. She's a great player. She's come uh, through the development system, but she hasn't had the court time at the Mystics. And you just think, imagine if she was possibly at the Pulse this season, she could have played almost every game. So are there, which players are out there if you are in contracting time that you start chasing down? Katrina Rorty, because she's yes. open to everything at the moment. So that would be her phone should be running hot <laughs> right now and especially if you are from the magic you should literally be ringing her every single day. I'd be turning up at her house and shopping flowers. a little gift basket. <laughs> <laughs> Papa. Yeah. Uh, so she would be top of my list um, signing somewhere on a piece of paper. Then I look to the Mystics and go they have got defenders there. Sokolich beats in. She's going to be back by next year. Phoenix Karaka we know she, she wants to play. She's been vocal about it. They've also got Kate Burley. Those are three outstanding players. They're going to probably start Sulu Fitzpatrick. So that's three players trying to fight for one spot. So, you know, should one of those girls be looking elsewhere? Should those other teams be going, I want Kate Burley. Kate Burley's been mm -hmm. outstanding. Can I get her to, you know, if Harrison does go and play volleyball, does, do you get her back for the stars? So it's those sorts of players I think I'd be looking at the stars. They've had four very good shooters. Do you leave Faulkner and Jamie Hume in the same team or do you look for one of those mm. two? Amelia Wormsley, I would be signing her. We've seen her play for the tactics. Did that give you any idea? Yes, I, <laughs> I had thought it wasn't of something. I face know, I, it's a happy face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, actually, funnily enough, the one star shooter who you didn't mention, Amarani Malasala, yes, yeah. because she, I remember being impressed with her a couple of years ago when she was yes. with the Magic. And then I, I'm disappointed, uh, disappointed that we haven't seen too much of her, but you can kind of see why. And I wonder too if that move, well no, it hasn't backfired for the stars, but having those four shooters, um, and ironically it was the shooting in the end that perhaps, you know, really was their Achilles heel, but we've, you know, ancient history now. But uh, yes, Malisala would be one. I wonder too if somebody will look over that, um, that magic side and perhaps you know, decide that Keanu Williams might be somebody oh, yes. that mm. you might want to, um, what's that word, when you want to try to grow a plant? Cultivate. Water them. <laughs> Water and feed them. Yeah. But, and, and bring them through. So, I mean, I don't think, yeah, it's a good, it's a really good question. It is a very good question. I think also with having two Auckland teams and also Magic has only really just done the highway. You can kind of, they can kind of entice players to just switch Auckland teams or possibly maybe you could still live in Auckland but you could... But you is know, that part back. of the problem for yes, the Magic? Yes, I was just going to say oh, we that. Pounce point. On you. I agree. No. Yes. Pounce I, away. Is it too easy to say, no, no, come and play with us in, in the Waikato, mm. but oh, you can stay up in Auckland? And I just don't know that that really works well for them. And I absolutely agree and I wonder if that has been part of the issue for the Magic this year, this decentralisation yeah. basically, that they are living all over the place. You know, there's some... You know, they're having to drive these big hours to training. And it has been a problem over the years for different teams. The only team, I think, that have been successful consistently with that travel has been the Deep South. And there's that two-hour drive between Dunedin yes. and Invercargill. But other teams in the past have really struggled with it when you do have all these people living in outlying places. I mean, where's Caitlin Bassett this year? She totally She's at the Mount, yeah. She's at yeah, the Mount, so they're all having to travel, you know. So it's a tricky one, and that definitely should should be taken into massive consideration when you're doing your contracting. So if you've got your leaders who are saying, I'll play for you, but only if I can live here, and then it sort of filters and trickles down, at what point do you go, right, I want to live here, I want to be part of this team, but surely the team comes first in trying to win the premiership because the Magic wouldn't want to go through what they went through this year. So does it come from the top where they go, actually, you know what, it's better if we do have a centralised uh, base? But then does that then come back to this blimmin' problem of money? Because mm. if I'm going to say, yeah, OK, yeah. you need to be here, yes. oh, and where am I going to live? Yeah. So do I then need, does the magic then have to provide housing? I mean, I think they've done that in the past, haven't they? Yes. I they think do. you've nailed it on the head. It's that semi-professional conundrum. Mm. Um, you want people to come and play, but 
Yeah, money's limited, and we know money is very limited at the moment with New Zealand having to take over and look after a number of teams this year because of the struggles that the franchises or some of the franchises have had with money. So, oh, again, it goes back to those CEOs and those coaches and those tough, tough decisions they're going to need to make in the very short time. And I guess too far, though. I mean, a couple of those yeah. people have, pl um, have players, have children. Yeah. They, I think. A lot of them have partners or husbands that all need to be, and I mean, Jobs. I guess, and they oh, have careers. It, yes. So, or, yeah, it's it's so complicated. It is. Maybe we think about this for a week and talk about yes. that next <laughs> week coming with new ideas. Yes, ne new ideas next week. But for this week and coming up, make sure you get your tickets to the ANZ Premiership Grand Final Spark Arena August 8th. We also have the Elimination Final this weekend down in Invercargill. From us here at Inside Netball, thank you so much for tuning in and listening.